I have that distance that I'm losing all of this heat around the pan. I'm heating grates 58% efficient. So regular radiant electric is around 70. It's about 70% efficient. But it's still, you're heating the glass, you have heat coming around the pan. This runs over 90. It's about 93% efficient because the pan is your heat source. So it's going to be faster than this, easier to clean. And the big thing is that that control, you know. So here I have my boil. I turn it down to a low simmer. Once it acknowledges that low number, it cycles down. So unlike regular radiant, I don't have to slide the pan away. And you know what's really cool is you do me a favor. Will you put this on just right on that cooktop? So you couldn't cause a fire with this even if you wanted to. So you're doing something like you're searing steaks or chops or something that splatters. I probably should have done it under the sauce before I showed that. But basically, that magnetic energy is going right through. It's a magnet, it's not an element. So your cleanup is a lot easier. You know, a lot, if anyone's used to a traditional radiant cooktop, you know if you spill cream or you did pasta and the starchy water over spills, that kind of bakes into the radiant top. Well, I'm not baking anything into this. The glass will get hot from the heat of the pan, but it's not hot enough to burn a towel. So it's the most efficient, easiest to clean. You have the same control as gas. And then the one thing that everyone kind of doesn't consider, because every time you get a cooktop, whether it's radiant, induction, gas, ventilation. Ventilation is to exhaust heat. Usually people are like, ah, I smell something, kick the hood on. Well, if you already smell it in the other part of the room, the grease and all that stuff is all over your ceiling and cabinets and all that. So whenever you fire up the heat, that's generally going towards your cold. So it's going towards the window, towards the door. And that takes the grease and smoke and smells with it. So my point is, whatever you're cooking on the stovetop, kick the vent hood on first. Because you want to exhaust that heat out of the kitchen. And now when you keep in mind this heat here, this is cranking more heat into the house. So, you know, during certain times of the year, now you're kicking on the AC. Back to efficiency. Here, I have this cranking on. I'm not sweating on top of this stovetop. So granted, I have the heat coming out of the pot, but I don't have all this heat coming around the pot. So when we have to look at what ventilation you need for induction, you can do down drafts, you can do just slim line you know, low CFM, you don't have to do some gargantuan 1300 CFM for the heat. So here I have a more powerful heat source and I don't need that same ventilation. So induction's a home run. I drank the Kool-Aid years ago. <laughs> well, to be honest, the first time I used it, I hated it because I was catering. Could you introduce yourself? Because I'm not sure. Sure. Yes. <laughs> well, you know what? It just kind of all happened. Like a <laughs> wave just happened. I thought I'd like stop you sure. Right yeah. So Sorry. my name's Kurt Von Kahl. I'm a chef. And I was just wandering the streets looking for a place to cook. And so, here I am. <laughs> so what I do is I work for about eight different appliance brands. And I work for some designers and builders. And so that's kind of how I know all the luxury brand appliances. And so I know a lot of appliance answers, but don't ask me about an Instapot. Hmm. I have no idea. But you were saying when you started, you were... You were, you were you know, yeah, so when I first used induction, I was working for a catering company, and it was horrible. It was so bad, it was like we had the maintenance guy down all the time because we just couldn't get it to work. And so he would come down, and he would hook up his electric gauge, and he'd be like, you guys are idiots, it works. And so he'd go to his truck and bring his magical pan. And his magical pan worked, but ours didn't. Because in 
commercial kitchens, everybody uses aluminum. So we stole his magical pot and we did everything in that. We sauteed and we just, we didn't make the connection until one day an equipment guy showed up and he's like, yeah, you idiot, it needs a magnet. <laughs> like, oh, so that's how we learned about the cookware. That's in that kitchen though, that's where I also learned about the ventilation because we were down on the fish pier in Boston so we couldn't have gas. We had no ventilation. And so once we learned the cookware was the, the secret sauce, so to speak, that's when we started to realize, wow, this gets a great simmer. You know, we're not burning things, we're holding things, you know. And the cleanup was that. Wipe it. So all I use whenever I'm cleaning these, chamois cloth and water. That's it. So no one can tell me a gas top is easier to clean. No. You're pulling grates. Bottom line, you know, and the heat that heats the pan radiates back down onto the surface. So anything that you spill around that burner ring kind of burns in there. You kind of bake it in there. So here, I'm not worried about that. I don't have to break out the razor blade to chisel away anything. It's not happening. Nothing bakes onto the top. So I'll show you this because this isn't, I don't own it, so. And I don't want to burn your uh, Brussels sprouts, so let me just turn these down. So what's the magic cookware? The magic cookware is, it has to have a ferrous metal in, in the pan. So for example, like, this is high carbon steel, so this is magnetic. And what they do in a lot of cookware today, you'll see multi-ply. So three-ply, five-ply, seven-ply. The more plies, the nicer the pan. Okay, because it's holding all that nice heat in. So I have a layer of high carbon steel in here and that creates that magnetic connection to produce the heat. So it's kind of the way it was always described to me is, if you ever as a kid you play with magnets, you stick two magnets together and they kind of polarize and they're kind of vibrating. Well, what happens here is the same thing with that metal is basically vibrating around producing the heat. And my control is how much power I'm allowing to it. So the other really cool thing about induction, and again, anyone here have an electric cooktop, regular radiant, okay? So you know when you turn it on either one or nine, it radiates on high. So let's say like rice, boil your water, turn it down, move the pan back, you're simmering the rice, and eventually you see it just kind of illuminate on high every 25 seconds, for example. So it's really hard to get that perfect low simmer in a regular radiant, what happens here is, on one, we don't see this water roll into a boil. On a regular radiant top, you would. This would roll to a boil and then shut off and then 25, 30 seconds later, do it again. In induction, it's just gonna run constant at that, in this example, let's say 10% of its wattage. So if it's a 2000 watt burner, it's running at about 200 watts on that low temperature. So it's really cool because you're keeping something constant. You're keeping soup and sauce warm. You're not worried about having to constantly stir it and worry about burning it. So induction allows a great low simmer. I find with most of the tops, like a one or a one and a half is really good to just melt butter or chocolate or anything like that. And then that's really the big thing for most when people are going from regular radiant to induction, they're typically used to cranking the pan up on a high heat because you want to get it nice and high and then you're just kind of moving the pan away. Well, with induction, you just turn it to, let's say you're going to saute. I find like your six and sevens, that pan's ready in a minute. You're not heating that pan for five minutes like a traditional top. It's ready in a minute. So it's like heavier ingredients ready because it's, it's really, really fast. So the learning curve is understanding the control of trying to keep those pans lower than higher. Do you know what I mean? Like you're going to find that anyone who, if you end up getting an induction top, you'll find that your, your fives and sixes are really nice and constant, perfect sautés. You're not, there's a lot, not a lot of guesswork with it. You know what I mean? And the response is right away. Yeah. Can you use cast iron on Yeah, this? definitely. And I've never scratched a top with it. So I wouldn't worry. And if you are worried, you know, you could always just put a towel down. So. 
Those are fine. Yeah, that porcelain coating. I've never scratched one, you know. And and some of the brands that I use, they have different kind of cast iron pans that I can use on the top to the oven sort of thing. And I've never ruined it. But again, like I said, if you're worried, put a towel down. You know? So non-stick is possible as long as you have a magnetic. Yeah, you'll see with some pans like you know, like all clad as a brand, what or what some manufacturers do, like what's what you see here. So they'll put the magnetic layer within this disc, and so this creates that heat source. The downside is, is the sides of my pan aren't producing that heat. So like rice and stuff will eventually burn. So that's also something to keep in mind as you look at cookware. When they kind of sandwich onto the bottom, that's not the best thing. You know what I mean? Because you're not getting uniform heat up the sides. Um, when you see multi-ply though, you'll see three ply, five ply, seven. More plies, the better the pan. You know, so like this is a seven ply skillet, but it's going to hold the heat all the way through. And you'll see tons of this stuff, like Bed Bath & Beyond or online or anywhere. But I'd stay away from something like this. Is it not uniform mainly because it's just a thinner metal or because it doesn't have the ferrous metal going up the side? That's exactly it. And plus, I mean, this is just cheap you know, aluminum basically, and then they just frame it with that. So, you know, it's okay if you're going to boil water for pasta, you don't need to go this route. But if you're going to do like a sauce or, or stocks or anything like that, you're better off with multiple plies so you're getting that nice uniformity, you know. But here, I'll show you this here. So this one, most 36 inch cooktops have five. This particular one is pretty cool because if you notice, instead of like your traditional round burners, they do square so that I don't have to have a bridge element. And if I'm doing a griddle or if I'm doing a roasting pan and making gravy in it, I can just straddle that right across the two burners. You know what I mean? Um, and this brand, this one's Thermador, they also, there's a top over there against the wall that's pretty unique because you can slide the pans, maybe it's that one, yeah, it's that one there. There's, if you see, there's like no fixed zones, is it that one? I think it is, yeah, right, yeah, so you can put the pan anywhere on the top and it finds it. But the really cool thing about it is you don't have to stay within, you know, a smaller zone parameter. So as you look at cooktops and you see those rings, you really don't want to exceed the ring by more than an inch. Because if I put a big pot like this down on a small burner, the burner's going to shut off because it's sensing this overheat that's past the ring. So you really want to match up according to the pans, according to those cook surface sizes. Whereas a cooktop like that, it doesn't matter. I can have four or five big pans on there and not worry about it. So it's cool. Yeah, but induction's a home run anyone's redoing your kitchen get rid of the gas and here I'll show you right here so here we'll crank this up and I'll just show you this is something that if you have a regular radiant electric at home you're definitely not going to do this so I was saying about the if you had a spillover or something like that So yeah, if you had a regular radiant top, there's no way you're going to do this because basically I'd have black cream in about a minute. Whereas this, there's no element, remember? The pan is your heat source. So the pan's heating up and it's bubbling my cream, but it's not going to burn it into the top. So, you know, so any sort of spillover, you're not worried. Your cleanup is easy. And granted, you know, I... I don't work here, so I'm just going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, Richie, I'm kidding. No, Do you have any idea how whoever invented this thought of it? I assume it was... You know, from what I understand, so it's been around for over 80 years, and I understand that it was created for um, use in submarines and on ships. So there's less heat in the kitchen in a submarine. And so it's been around. It's not new technology. It's been around for a long time, and it's really... This kind of segues into why you guys are here today, but it, it's really because in Europe and abroad, people have been concerned about efficiency. Here, 
we didn't really care until more recently. You know, and so, because back in the 80s, I think it was maybe GE and maybe Gen Air had induction, but it was way too expensive. And throughout Europe and Asia, they focused on that because efficiency is, that's key. And so they created tops that were more affordable and user-friendly, user and eventually that kind of migrated over here over the last decade or so. And price point has now come down. I mean, it was, gosh, I mean, Richie can attest to this. There was a top, the Diva, that thing was like $6,000 back 15 years ago. You know, not too many of us are dropping that money for a cooktop. You know, now you can see these in small, medium, and large. Every brand carries induction, so it's not just Thermidor or whoever. Everybody carries it. And what are the price ranges? It's going to be more than regular Radiant, mm -hmm. but you'd have to ask these guys. It's probably about a third a more. What's that? We've got a slide with price ranges. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know what? I, but I think if you look at two, twofold, if it's more, it's less in usage. It's less in heat in the kitchen, you know what I mean? So, but there's every price point. I mean, I, I was in Ikea, they have induction cooktops, you know what I mean? So there's really pricey ones like that one I mentioned over there where you have the magical put the pan anywhere. That's probably going to be top of the food chain, but everywhere in between, you know. But it really helps in installations, you know, especially like this. A lot of times when people do something like, a, an island or a peninsula and they do cooking here because they want to do this and entertain all their friends, the, you know, the reality is they don't want this hood in the way, so they'll do downdrafts. Well, downdrafts are better than nothing, but it's closer to nothing, you know, because you're, just think the science, you're fighting it. Naturally, warm air rises. You're trying to get that to go down. So, Downdrafts are really hard, but they actually work with induction because now I'm only trying to capture what's coming out of the pan, not what's coming around the pan. So induction works great with downdrafts. Still, if you can do an overhead, you're always better, but it's another thing to keep in mind. What's the depth of, it? What's the depth of one of these? Most of the cooktops are about four inches. Yeah. So, you know, let's say on average. Is it yeah. easy to break? I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> um, I mean, I haven't. Usually these, to be honest with you, most of the time these are broken on installation. Like somebody's like, oh, I can cut that marble. Snap. You know, or pot rack over glass top. <coughs> it happens. You know, so you don't have to have, like, kid gloves with this. But, I mean, it can take... It can take a little bit of beating. It's, you know, it's a thicker glass. It's not, you know, like a, like a thin window pane. I mean, it's, it's tough glass because it can also withstand the heat. You, know, you figure the heat of that pan radiating down onto the surface, you know, and, and that's going to be another the variable when you're looking at any of them of a price point. If something's around, whatever, 800 bucks and something's like $2,800, well, it could be the quality of the glass. The wattage levels and all of that sort of stuff but still i mean you know the one i have at home i i have a pretty good top at home but i've also have these portable ones i use for catering and those i mean i beat the heck out of them and they've never broken and they're cheap <laughs> you know induction? yeah yeah they're like a countertop you know a little single burner i think it's like 1500 or 1600 watt so it's not going to be like one of these, but it, it helps if you want to heat water, you know, something you simple. Volt service not a, most of these tops are always going to be a 220, 240. You know, whether it's a 30 inch is typically 30 amps. As you get into your 36s, this can go upwards of 40 amps. So yeah, now not in your built-in tops, more like that countertop piece, a single burner, you know. Yeah, those are always going to be you know, standard plug, 120, yeah. But anything built in is going to be a higher, without a doubt. Yeah, like in most commercial buildings, they're 208, but you're still looking at 30 amps. It's pretty significant. They have individual, like, built-in singular pieces, but those, I want to say, are 20 amp anyway. Yeah, and there's different brands that carry those, yeah. Are they only sold as stove top like that? Oh, no, they have ranges. Yeah, they have ranges like, 
if you guys get a chance, if you go around the showroom, there's a kitchen straight back over there in the corner, and that has the Bosch brand, and Bosch has a traditional 30-inch slide-in range induction top, and works great. Yeah. Yeah, same scenario. So those are really good also because when someone does a traditional 30-inch range, a lot of times they'll do the over-the-range microwave. So back to the ventilation thing. The over-the-range microwave, it's better than nothing, but it's, you know, you figure that your vent's only this little thing in the back, you know. And over-induction, again, we don't have tons of heat coming out or around the pan, so at least with that, it's going to work. But yeah, take a look at that. But every brand has them. GE has it. Frigidaire has it. They all carry a, your traditional 30-inch range, whether it be freestanding or slide-in. And then you can go more into the pro stuff, like Viking. They have an induction range, but, you know, it's that big stainless steel look and all that you're paying for. Yeah. All right, well, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming tonight um, to join us in this incredibly smelling location. <laughs> uh, we're so happy to have all of you here. I'm Regina LaRock. I'm one of the um, new members of the leadership team of Sustainable Wellesley, and we also have here tonight the remainder of the leadership team. We have Lisa Olney over here, Scott Bender, Quentin Prideau, Phyllis Tierman, and Mary Gard. Everybody's lined up here in the back. <laughs> you can't see them at all. But, um, so we're really pleased to be here at Jarvis Appliances, and we also want to extend our big thanks to Jarvis for hosting us tonight and providing this incredible space. And of course, to Kurt Van Wall. Yep, thanks to Jarvis. Oh, stop, stop. <laughs> And Kurt Van Call, our chef, and of course Janine Malone, our wine consultant, who's yeah. brought in the yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think maybe before I go too far, I just want to also point everybody to two big events that are coming up that we'd like to also invite you to on Thursday, January, January 31st at 7 at the UU Church. There will be a conversation about recycling crisis here in town, and so we invite all of you to join us for that. And on Sunday, February 10th at 5.30, Sustainable Wellesley will be hosting an evening with the candidates for our candidates for municipal elections in Wellesley. And we want to invite you all to that as well. So uh, we're here tonight because at Sustainable Wellesley and also on the Natural Resources Commission in town, we're concerned about natural gas, natural gas that is <coughs> leaking in our community from uh, pipes that are, whoo, <laughs> pipes that are, are leaking. Uh, we're concerned about climate change and how natural gas is a part of that puzzle. And I think our main reason for being here tonight is to think about how that affects the decisions that we make as individuals every day in our own lives. Things like the appliances we choose to put in our homes and the way we choose to cook our food. And it's really a big honor to have tonight with us um, Zainab Magavi and Audrey Shulman, who have been pioneers, I think, for the area of Boston and New England and teaching us about what's happening with our natural gas infrastructure and showing us uh, maybe a different way for the future. So Audrey Shulman is the co-founder and executive director of Home Energy Efficiency Team, HEAT. Um, she also worked with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council to lead the Fix Our Pipes study that really documented the massive number of gas leaks we have in our municipalities in New England. Um, she's a wonderful friend and an author as well, and we're really pleased to have her. Um, and Zainab Magavi is right next to me. <laughs> Zainab, also a friend and a real... Um, superstar. Uh, she has a master's in environmental sustainability and has taken the lead in providing us data so we can understand um, how we fix the leaks that we have in our communities. And both of them have hosted a number of these events teaching communities about uh, how we get off of natural gas and choose to cook in a way that's healthier and frankly also delicious. I'd lastly like to point you all to a pamphlet that's available to everybody at the end if you want to take it on your way out just to review some of the health and um, environmental concerns about gas for you as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Audrey and Zainab who are going to give us a short presentation about why cooking with induction stovetops matters. Um, and we have slides 
I don't know if we can all manage to get into view, but we can give it a try. We'll try to be pretty quick. This is not a long presentation, because I know it smells really good and I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and I put down my glass of wine. So um, this is brought, this presentation is a collaboration between Mothers Out Front and Heat. Um, and in this collaboration, uh, Mothers Out Front is, as if, for those of you who don't know, a growing grassroots movement of mothers where mothers are allies. Uh, and HEAT is a small incubator that convenes and generates expertise and research and ideas. And both of them have the shared purpose of ensuring a swift, just, efficient transition off of fossil fuels for our children's future. And this is my uh, youngest daughter, uh, who is currently eight. She was born in 2010. <coughs> Which means that every time they have a climate prediction for 2030, I know she's 20. And when they have a climate <laughs> prediction for us getting, as Massachusetts has committed to, off of fossil fuels by 2050, I know she's 40, which is younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that is really kind of the underlying motivation for our effort to try to make a, a just, fast, swift, reasonable transition to where we need to get. And the reason is that it's a, it's a real threat. And I don't need to tell you guys, I know the news has told you a little bit now, <laughs> um, as things uh, that have been predicted have begun to happen. And in the next slide, um, here in Massachusetts, you know, last year was a big year for this. In 2018, we saw flooding on the waterfront, flooding and, and unseasonable temperatures. And we know we're living it which is hard to accept, honestly, even for me. Um, so instead of thinking about the worst, we like to think about the good news. <laughs> and the good news is that it's here, yes, but we also have, we know what to do. We know what the problem is. It's not a mystery. We are burning fossil fuels and filling our, our, our atmosphere. If we stop, it will get fixed. <laughs> so we need to reduce our energy use Increase renewable energy use, which eventually squeezes out fossil fuels. Another good news, we've already started. We're on our way. We have a certain percentage of our state's electricity is renewable. Uh, we have the technology to do this. That's also really good news. And I have the next slide. Um, the other good news that I don't think people talk about is, you know, we've, we've done this before. We've transitioned. We're humans. We keep evolving and changing and getting the latest gadgets. I mean, if you think about the cell phone. But, um, but even, even in the, the heart of the home, we used to cook on fires outside, and we thought it was super cool when we brought the fire inside and put it in a big cast iron box, right? And then we evolved again, and we started cooking with gas. But we, it's been stuck there for a while. And it's not actually that big a deal to evolve again and cook with clean, renewable power. And if we source our electricity from renewable energy, then our efficient induction stoves, they fix the problem in our homes. So we're going to go back to um, talking about why that gas stove, why we're focusing there, and why we're here. Well, first of all, because there's food, and, and food is fun. But... <laughs> But also because people generally, what we found is if we looked at transitioning the home, and that is actually one of the hardest parts to our society's transition, is transitioning our homes. And if we, when we looked at transitioning our homes, people didn't really care how their heat happened as long as it was cheap and it was warm. And they didn't care so much about their hot water as long as it was cheap and warm. But people do care about their stove. It's kind of... It's where they cook for their family. And so talking about how we cook is to us maybe the core part of how we talk about transitioning together. So coming back to gas, and I know this was mentioned, um, uh, uh, Kurt did an amazing job talking about ventilation. And I just want to quickly give you the background so you understand why that is something we need to think about. So conventional gas, which is kind of our grandmother's gas, what was before, um, you, you drill down and you get the gas and you, it just flows out of a bubble under the rock. Now, starting in about, uh, about, about well, I guess 10 years ago or more, um, we're doing this fancy thing where we drill down and go horizontal and 
pump fluid with chemicals until it fractures. That's why it's called fracking. <coughs> fractures the rock, which is crazy if you start to think about how much pressure fractures rock. And then uh, it flows back up um, with all the little bubbles that are trapped in the rock. They, they flow up because gas is lighter. So that's fracking. And the, the, the interesting thing about it, the next, I'm going to go quickly, I promise not too much science, um, is the gas we're using in our stoves when we turn on our, our stoves in our kitchen, it's now changed. No one's aware of this change, but it is no longer conventional gas. It is now shale gas, fracked gas. In Massachusetts, about 80% of our gas comes from Pennsylvania, which is just covered with fracking fields. <laughs> um, and you can see that's true all over the country, that fracked shale gas production, that's what, where we're getting our gas now. And it's a boom that is actually celebrated by many, but it's a boom that has costs. It has costs to the health of the communities that are um, enduring it, um, but also there is a question of what it, and, and part of that cost to the communities is um, the question of what is in the um, fracking fluid. And unlike every other industry that is required to report chemicals to, a, um, to the public, the fracking industry, thanks to Cheney's loophole, um, there's not a movie out with that, um, they don't, they're not required to report anything that's considered proprietary. So I, I love this little cartoon. Um, it kind of gets right at it. Um, so we don't actually know. They voluntarily report about 80% of the chemicals that they use in the fracking industry. Um, they are very much reassured that they're healthy and fine and all is good. Um, but a lot of people have been asking, well, one, what's in it? Then we we'll go next. Um, and, and two, are the things from the fracking, fracking fluid, are they coming through the pipelines to our homes in Massachusetts? And so um, some concerned allies ran a study last year um, testing the gas in the Boston area to see are there volatile organic compounds in the gas. And they confirmed that yes, there were more than 100 volatile organic compounds in the gas and are now beginning a phase two study to kind of scale up and have a more, a larger um, analysis of the gas coming into the area. Um, so when uh, Kurt said to use your ventilation, um, we would like to really encourage you. Uh, we'll, we'll We'll keep up, you know, we'll, we'll update everyone with data as it comes out. But for now, I would say it looks like some fracking chemicals, about 25% 20 of the chemicals found also were reported by fracking companies as fracking chemicals. So it looks like it's possible that some chemicals are traveling through the pipelines to our homes. Um, no proof yet. So. Uh, there have been, however, a lot of studies um, trying to ask questions about the connection between gas and health. And there's some studies indicating there's a connection between cooking with gas on your stove and childhood asthma incidents. Um, there haven't been a lot of studies. There's not a lot of funding to look at gas and health. Um, there needs to be more. But for now, we would really like to say, please turn on your hood. <laughs> And if you don't have a hood that actually vents, open your window a crack. Um, and if you don't want to do either of those things, or you happen to be ready for a new stove, really, it's a great idea to consider induction. And I'm going to turn it over to Audrey to tell you more about that. Okay. Um, so, Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, induction, as uh, Kurt said so so clearly, it's not only faster and more precise, but it's actually uh, safer than gas. Um, and it's been used in Europe for 20 years. A lot of chefs here now understand why it is so much better than gas. Um, it's, not, it's not new in any way. Uh, next slide. And how it works, as Kurt said, is basically there's a, there's a magnet, an electromagnet, in the, the stove top and it uh, makes the electrons in the pan uh, move you know from left to right left to right left to right and as they, as they move it's the same as like rubbing your hands it creates friction 
and friction creates heat. So instead of the, the burner getting hot, the pan actually gets hot. Um, the pan becomes the burner. Uh, next slide. Um, and because of that, instead of having the gas uh, make a flame and the flame heats up the air and then the bur you know and then that heats up the pan and then that heats up the food, you're just much more directly heating the pan and then heating the food. So it's faster. It's more efficient. And um, in terms of like, I, I, I'll fess up. I actually have a gas stove in my house. It's an old one. And so my, uh, my husband does a lot of cooking. He frequently turns it on low and the, the, you know, the, light, the flame you know, sort of puffs off. And about you know, 10 minutes later, I'll be like, and run downstairs and like, you know, stop the house from exploding. So it's, it's, it's safer. And my mom, when she visits the house, uh, she frequently, you know, she turns, she gets a cup of tea just before bed, she turns on the flame, she falls asleep, she forgets about the flame. And induction would be safer in both situations. It's never going to, the flame's never going to go out and release an explosive gas into your house. Um, and it's never, you know, if you take the pan off, it will not get hot. And you, you should all try that out on this. You know, if the pan's not there, it's just a magnet, right? There's nothing to heat. So in both cases, it would be safer. And in this uh, slide, which you can't see so well, uh, there's, uh, there's a pan, you know, where the pan stops, it does not get hot. So this chocolate on the left, where it's not on the pan, is not getting hot. And where it's on the pan, it's getting hot. It's really amazing. You can cook through a paper towel. It's, it's just an incredible, without the paper towel catching on fire. It's an amazing technology. OK, next one. So uh, as was said, IKEA is now selling them Home Depot. You can buy, a, a, you know, a, at like $900, you can buy an inset, uh, you know, where it goes right into your countertop. Uh, uh, and or you can get the whole range, I think, from Home Depot for 900 bucks. Um, or here at Jeremy's. <laughs> 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 or a much <laughs> There goes my discount. Um, it's, it's a much nicer, much, much nicer one here. And better but service. And so better better service. service. And it's, and it's much, local. Much better it's local. service. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> To go back to uh, the reason, and I'll just, you know, also Home Depot always sells like seconds. It's not so good. Um, <laughs> the reason, the reason why say. is because like people care about their gas stoves, and they don't care about, you know, their gas heat. You know, most people don't even know how their hot water is heated, right? But they really do care about their gas stoves. So we're picking that first because this is going to be the, the 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 thing that can, op you know, make it so that people transition their whole homes. And we want you to transition because uh, it's what we need to do. Um, next slide. It's already, ha oh boy, that doesn't look good. Um, <laughs> the, it's really washed out here. Already companies are doing it, countries are doing it, right? With, for instance, just car companies. Volvo, 100% of its cars will be all electric by 2019 wow. now. Wow. Uh, Jaguar and Land Rover, 2020. Mercedes-Benz by 2022. You know, the American companies are behind <laughs> with Ford. They will have 13 models by 2023. Um, and, uh, but we, uh, they are transitioning. And if car companies are doing it, we certainly can. Uh, you know, countries are doing it. We need to do it. Um, so here's, here's our idea. We don't want you, you know, like, it, it, just tossing all your appliances out all the time. But instead, you know, next time your appliance uh, is about ready to go, just have a wish list ready so that you're ready to transition. Um, and we have uh, these uh, handy wish lists here. Hmm. Um, so you can just put it up, you know, do the shopping now. I suggest looking at the EPA site or um, at Mass CEC. They have lovely rebates. You can, find, you can get lots of information now, and then when your heating system uh, dies, as mine did, <laughs> last year in the, you know, like in the middle of the coldest part of, you, you know what you want. Um, okay, next one. And then the second possible action we want to suggest 
is to host events like this because uh, then you can get the word out to other people about induction, about transitioning to electricity, which is greenable. Like our electricity is already more made, you know, made with renewables. The more, you know, every passing year it's going to be more greened. So that's why we want to transition. We want to build the people power to, next one, uh, build the transition that we want for the planet, for our, for our children, for our grandchildren. Um, next one, we want to thank Jarvis enormously, uh, and uh, Lisa and uh, Sustainable Wellesley, and um, uh, just all of you for being here. Thank you so much. And um, uh, if any of you are more interested in uh, mothers out front or in heat, I, uh, please tell us and so we can get you more information or you can Google them. And uh, just in case anybody is interested, we have uh, one donation, uh, a, uh, a foundation who, if we get 20 more uh, monthly donors of any level at all, we will uh, get fifty thousand dollars. So I'm just wow. going to mention. Yeah, I know. Nice. Um, and it's safe. And uh, thank. Two, two, two more quick things. Yeah. Um, one, I just want to say that this idea of switching to induction is not just for Wellesley. That when the Merrimack Valley gas oh, explosion yeah. happened, mm -hmm. um, heat and and then mothers out front, we we went and delivered induction single burner cooktops to seven hundred households in me. Um, because they were more efficient so they could, their electric systems could handle it and they could boil the water to bathe their kids faster. Um, and the, the impact of that was just, uh, it was really incredible and moving to see. Um, and uh, almost everyone who got one is still using it. Um, so we want to make sure this is a, a across all parts of our society. Yeah. Um, and, and then also just... Uh, I went to the first ever electrification conference. It was full of industry people. And all the industry was all, oh, we have the technology. Oh, we're going to make lots of money electrifying everything. Oh, blah, blah, blah. And every session, they talked about, well, the part we have no idea how to do is, are households actually going to transition? Because oddly enough, part of the core piece of transition to protect our children's future is in the hands of household decision making. So that's part of why we're here. This is actually in your hands. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.